Great, thank you, Marinka. Can you hear me well? Can you see the slides? Yes, so we can hear you and see the slides. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Marinka and Yura, for the kind invitation. It's really a pleasure to speak to this crowd. And uh, so far, I've been enjoying uh, the symposium very, very much. So this is uh, incredibly stimulating. Um, what I would like to share with you today is, are some thoughts and some later work uh, that, that we've been doing in the lab. And let me start with two rather uh, provocative sentences uh, that most people will relate to, I think. Uh, drug development is still largely an art, and drug repurposing is still largely an accident, and largely because things are changing uh, at a very fast pace, but this is what we've been experiencing. And part of that is because of the extreme complexity of humans uh, that you will also relate. And I'm sure that all of you have seen some sort of this hierarchical organization of biological complexity going all the way down from uh, genomic information all the way up to the phenotype itself. And this hierarchical organization spans four orders of magnitude in space, five orders of magnitude in time. And where do drugs fit in here? So how do we predict from computationally where a drug will act and what part of the phenotype are we going to modify? Uh, we still have several challenges trying to understand genetic mutations and, and their impact on phenotypes. So this is a, a really big problem. And the way that we're trying to approach this is from a knowledge generation perspective. And then we are based on the tenet that data leads to information and that information leads to knowledge. And that is data is about the, the raw numbers. Information is really the context in which you put that. And really knowledge is when you start putting things together. So it really makes sense that uh, we try to merge sources of information to represent uh, current knowledge and perhaps to infer new knowledge. And this is a, um, a very simple uh, depiction of that. If we had, let's say, information about genes that connect to diseases by genetics and drugs to, that connect to genes or proteins by molecular experiments, one could relatively easy easily try to create sort of a, a network diagram. And here we see green dots as uh, autoimmune diseases and red are neurological diseases. And now we try to uh, lay them out uh, in their neighborhoods. And then we zoom in into one particular disease of my interest, which is multiple sclerosis. And we can see that, yes, most of the genes that are genetically associated with multiple sclerosis in the neighbor, are in the neighborhood of drugs that are being used to treat multiple sclerosis. So this is kind of an indication uh, that perhaps integrating different types of data is the right way to go. Now, uh, this uh, sets the, the same way to introduce the concept of heterogeneous networks, which are networks in which there are multiple kinds of nodes and edges as opposed to a homogeneous network in which all nodes are of the same type. And for this type of heterogeneous networks, classic network metrics do not apply really for analysis. So if there's a lot of science that has been developed and, and Laszlo had a big uh, part in, in this describe, describing uh, the mathematical uh, underpinning of, uh, of, of homogeneous networks. Now, when we're talking about heterogeneous networks, then really the best example that we have, I think is social networks that are very, uh, a different structure and, and the kind of questions that one can ask is, is very different. So what can we do uh, and, and why really a knowledge network? Well, to make use of existing data. The internet is, is full of data that even if it's not fully curated, we can take advantage if we uh, uh, know how to integrate it. And, and this goes back to the uh, eternal disagreement between getting the details right of reductionistic approaches versus getting the whole picture of, of holistic approach, uh, approaches. And, and really networks allow us to, to deal with complex systems. So humans are not complicated, humans are complex. So the tax code is complicated, building a triple seven is complicated. Uh, humans uh, display nonlinear dynamics, they, they display interdependence, they display the emergent properties. So, this is what we need to try to model if we're gonna get 
the details right and to try to predict a phenotype. In this uh, sense, I would argue that medicine is behind the curve in terms of full utilization of artificial intelligence and machine learning approaches that have been pioneered by other fields such as physics, even economics, e-commerce, and, and so on. So uh, what are the recent efforts in terms of, of trying to, to bring this, this seemingly disparate sources of data into a single place? Well, um, we know of the, uh, Google's data commons effort. So uh, Ramanathan B. Guha uh, has uh, set this up in, uh, within Google uh, for quite some time now. And what they're trying to do is to do the next generation of, of, of browsers in which you're not only looking for URLs, but you're looking for the data that is behind them. And you're linking the data so that you can create more complex queries. Another big effort now more in the biomedical space is that by the Biomedical Data Translator Program, the NCATS uh, uh, directorship at the NIH. And the Biomedical Translator, uh, of which we are part with one team, uh, the, the main idea there is that a user will be able to search uh, in, in a browser uh, a, a colloquial term or a question, and that will be translated by what is called an autonomous relay system which will parse that question from natural language and will translate it into a machine readable form. Then that uh, autonomous relay system will um, hit a set of autonomous relay agents that will consult with different knowledge providers. And these are different teams in the translator that are working on different knowledge providing uh, um, tools and the autonomous relay agents, which are bringing, searching for that information, bringing it back, synthesizing it, and then return back the response to the user. So this is the big picture in NCATS translator. Then another effort is the one that uh, NSF through the Convergence Accelerator program is pioneering. And here we're also con uh, contributing with a team. And our team here is a multi-scale Open Knowledge Network for Biomedicine, which we call SPOKE. Uh, on the left is our team. And you can see a metagraph of the network here. It contains millions of concepts related by uh, tens of millions of, of, of bona fide relationships, the same as you will bring from a database that you consult uh, regularly. So what are knowledge networks used for, uh, useful for? Uh, I'll show you a few examples and then we'll talk a little bit about COVID. But uh, one of the uh, things that we started uh, realizing early on is that perhaps link prediction might be a good strategy to uncover aspects of disease biology. And I'm a geneticist by training. I was always interested in the fact that not every gene has the same a priori probability of being associated with the disease. So can we learn anything from biology to increment that a priori probability so that when we get the p-value in a genome-wide association study, we can interpret that uh, correctly. And the nice thing about link prediction in, in a heterogeneous network is that it embraces network heterogeneity naturally. It is scalable and it allows supervised learning. And furthermore, and importantly, it is interpretable. It's not a black box. So the, some of the algorithmic features of link prediction in this uh, sense is uh, it, it, first you define certain topological features that will use into uh, a, a machine learning approach that then uh, can be translated into probabilities for that particular link to uh, exist or not. So this was work done by Daniel Himmelstein, a former grad student in the lab. And in this particular work, you can see uh, part of the metagraph linking genes and tissues and diseases and some gene signatures. So the main concept here is that if one wants to understand whether there is a potential association, genetic association between the gene IRF1 and the disease multiple sclerosis, we don't know if these associations exist, but we do know that there's several protein-protein interactions with these genes. We know that it's associated with another disease. We know a lot about the neighborhood of that gene. So then we can compute the different features and the different paths that lead from this gene to the target disease 
and then we can quantify mathematically what the importance is by downgrading the number of, of connections that that has in the network just to avoid the, 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 the hub problem. But then we can numerically quantify the importance of uh, each of those paths and we can translate that into features to feed into, in this case, a logistic rate regression model. And here is the, the uh, ROC performance of the algorithm trying to identify all the known genetic associations as taken uh, from the GWAS catalog. And so the, 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 uh, the performance of the algorithm is, is fairly good given that this is in the absence of any experimentation. This is just following prior information and then feeding into the model to see, to show that not every gene has the same probability a priori to be uh, associated with a given disease. And if we look at the precision recall curve, uh, you can say, well, it's, it's fairly modest, but if you take the, 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 the prior probability of association, which is the assumption in any G was, this is a 200 fold enrichment over the prior uh, um, uh, a, a, a assumption that every gene is equally likely to be associated with a disease. And furthermore, it's interpretable because you can find the features that contributed the most to this prediction. So in this case, we know that uh, uh, tissue specificity plays a, 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 an okay role, but interactions among proteins, so what Laszlo talks about uh, disease modules, that plays a larger role in the final predictability of the model. Well, let me switch gears a little bit now to talk about uh, uh, drug discovery and how, uh, what are the, some of the challenges that, that uh, we're facing in this space. And the problem is that common genetic susceptibility can inform about drug repositioning efforts. Uh, and we think that that's, that's a, a, a valid avenue. And because if entire categories of diseases share common genetic factors, can they also share Therapy. So this is the, the very simple question that everybody in the field starts asking. And again, Laszlo was one of the pioneers in, in this uh, 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 field by creating the drug disease networks and the disease disease networks and the disease modules. So what we try to do here is to, uh, with our um, knowledge network, what happens if we eliminate uh, all the indications of the small molecules uh, here on the left and all the diseases in the right, if we eliminate all this uh, interaction, so all the, the known treatments, what is our chances that we can predict them back by navigating paths in, in this network? So in this case, uh, the pipeline is that we started with uh, the, the spoke network. We extracted features to quantify the prevalence of certain paths. Then we fitted a regularized regression model and to measure the performance of those uh, features in predicting the right indications, we permuted the network in several uh, ways to break down the system, if you wish, to, to see what the, the, the expected uh, contribution uh, of, of the network architecture itself would be. Again, the nice uh, thing about this is that you can quantify which are the features that contribute the most to your predictability. And in this case, uh, we were able to reconstruct uh, um, several of the uh, known disease modifying treatments. And here, and this is a very uh, primitive list, but you can see that the ones with the highest prediction are all disease modifying. So we're reconstructing what are the, um, uh, the disease modifying therapies. But however, in some cases, there are some that have a very high prediction and they're not known disease modifying therapies. So these are the ones that we might want to go after. They have good prediction, but yet they're not known treatments. So uh, when we computed the prediction performance overall, uh, we can get, we can retrieve back uh, almost 98% of all uh, known disease drug associations if we use uh, uh, a database of, of disease modifying drugs. If we use another database for indication that was not the same database that we use for training, uh, then the performance drops a, a little bit, but still acceptable. Even if we use clinical trials as the, the source of truth, which is completely unbiased and very noisy because some of those trials work, some they don't. Uh, we have a, a relatively 
uh, interesting uh, area under the curve. So uh, this is uh, an approach that, uh, that holds some promise in terms of uh, identifying diseases for treatment and also for drug repurposing. So one of our uh, um, efforts in multiple sclerosis is this international collaboration uh, funded by the Progressive MS Alliance. And this is um, a collaboration which uh, started from the bioinformatic uh, prioritization of, um, of drugs that could be applied to neuronal protection or oligodendrocyte development or uh, um, uh, oligodendrocyte uh, um, uh, uh, maturation, which is the cell that produces the myelin, which is what is broken in, in multiple sclerosis. So in this effort, what we're doing is we're utilizing uh, Spoke, the knowledge network, to prioritize which are, which are the compounds that we think could um, uh, either increase neuronal protection or uh, stimulate oligodendrocyte differentiation that could result in uh, remyelination. And the other teams are working in uh, phenotypic assays that are very sophisticated, very um, related to the biology. Uh, for example, utilizing uh, uh, pluripotent stem cells uh, in, in, in vivo uh, animal models of demyelination, genetic models, and so on. So this uh, approach is, is yielding, um, so far we started with, with 511 compounds and we eliminated some for high toxicity. Uh, the short list uh, is 160 compounds, which then were further prioritized to 32. Again, when you're dealing with a sophisticated uh, in vitro or in vivo assay, by definition almost, it cannot be high throughput. So this is why the approach is, let's try to use informatics first to create this uh, prioritization and then uh, take our lead compounds to, uh, um, to validation. So let me again switch gears a little bit to talk about uh, COVID-19. And a lot has been said already. And uh, it, what we try to do is to first try to understand if we have the right data in uh, in the knowledge network to work with. So this paper got a lot of attention over the summer because it kind of utilized a large supercomputer to create a hypothesis of what happens when someone gets infected with SARS-CoV-2. And the main take home message here was that the, uh, not only the renin angiotensin system was uh, involved, but also the hyaluronic acid was uh, part of the, um, uh, of the uh, pathology in these individuals. And the question was, can we reconstruct this with the data that we have at hand? So this is something that we tried to do. We started by, uh, uh, yes, we have the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. We know that it binds the receptor in humans. Then we know that this receptor binds these other proteins and encodes, is encoded by this gene. Then we know all the information about this gene. And here we start reconstructing the vasoconstriction and vasodilation uh, properties of these molecules. Then we have uh, components of the coagulation cascade, the endocrine components, immune regulation components, uh, some of the tissue specific expression of these molecules, even the connection to the hyaluronic acid we were able to, to reconstruct. So again, as a checkout, we have the right elements so far. The network is never going to be finished, by the way. We're continuously adding databases to it. But so far, this is a good indication. And with this, we could make uh, a, a very interesting observation in collaboration with my colleague Sui Wang at the Institute for Systems Biology. Uh, we identified very early on that uh, utilizing the, the, the knowledge network that there was one protein called midkine that got upregulated when the um, fibroblasts or, or the, the epithelial cells in the lungs got stretched. So mechanical stretch induced the expression of this protein called midkine, which is highly sensitive to corticosteroids. So the prediction that we made here uh, in May was that corticosteroids might be uh, effective in controlling uh, disease only in ventilated patients because these were 
uh, you're mechanically stretching the fibroblasts of these patients. So a couple of months later, then this uh, um, New England Journal of Medicine paper uh, validate this in, in the clinic, and then uh, another uh, paper followed up, and then both the EMA and the FDA uh, use this as, as their recommendation. So again, uh, some of the modest uh, uh, wins that one could start uh, creating from a, um, uh, a knowledge network are already evident. So the other example that I want to uh, switch to towards the end is through our collaboration with UCSF, uh, UCSF Information Commons. Uh, this is a program led by Atul Butte at UCSF and, and Keith Yamamoto. And Information Commons is, is basically a repository data lake of uh, a, a huge numbers of, of data that are patient related, including the identified electronic uh, medical records from uh, millions of patients. And so we are using this uh, electronic medical records, this is work by Charlotte Nelson, another grad student in the lab, to create an embedding algorithm to basically create health profiles, individualized health profiles of, in the, of, of patients uh, based on uh, the structure portion of the, uh, of the um, electronic health record. So far, we, we do not have the ability to um, in introduce uh, uh, the, the notes into this embedding. We're working on that. But even looking at the uh, structure portion, we can uh, embed into the network and create individual patient signatures. And with this, we can, in, in, in turn, create profiles for diseases in, entirely. So for example, this is the um, a subset of all the patients which have a diagnosis of post-traumatic post stress disorder at UCSF. So about 4,000 patients. So when we put all of them together, we can create a map for PTSD. And the nice thing about uh, this approach is that we know exactly which nodes of the network are underlying uh, this uh, two-dimensional heat map. And then we can use image uh, uh, analysis to find, okay, which are the diseases which resemble this map of PTSD? So these are the top 10 diseases. Uh, and again, to create these, we use uh, close to a million uh, patients uh, uh, as a training set. And we can see that PTSD resembles features with bipolar disorder, with nicotine dependence, with schizophrenia, with depression, with alcohol dependence. So all of these are things that uh, make sense from a clinical perspective. Now, and just for fun, we computed which one is the least uh, similar to PTSD, well, atopic dermatitis is a skin condition. So that checks out. Uh, but not only that, it's nice to see that you can Deep, deep, uh, dig deeper into each of the pixels of this image and know which are the nodes of the knowledge graph or the knowledge network that contribute to that pixel being important for this disease. So then if we take, let's say the top 10 pixels, we can go deeper into under the hood, if you wish. And so let me zoom in here. So we can see that, for example, nicotine is a very important note here. And nicotine is related to nicotine dependence, the condition, uh, and nicotine dependence is linked to a number of genes by genetic analysis. Nicotine uh, dependence is associated with symptoms like chronic pain. And nicotine on, on the other part of the subgraph, you can see some of the side effects of nicotine and so on. So these are the notes that make this map unique. So we can create maps for every disease. So in, in this case, uh, we can create, uh, we can see the maps that all the cancers uh, here uh, highlighted in red. You see that they have similar features in the image. And then if we look at in green, all the autoimmune diseases, they also have similar features. And then uh, psychiatric diseases in blue, they all have similar features. So this is the, in, an interesting problem now to try to identify uh, the clinical records and the nodes to see whether we can predict uh, the emergence of these diseases before they're manifested, before the code is added to their records. So this is one of the things that we're planning. There's plenty more things. And 
just to close, I would like to show you um, uh, one uh, feature that, that we're uh, uh, making public of this book, which is a, a web interface for people to be able to interact. Uh, this is we call the Spoke Neighborhood Explorer. This is the URL. Uh, you can see that there are some uh, sample queries, uh, or you can I, enter your ident your favorite compound, disease, pathway, uh, uh, or or gene. But then, if you click here, there's some pre-assembled queries. For example, uh, this is the SARS-CoV Molecular Explorer, where we can see each of the SARS-CoV proteins uh, in light blue and their associations to each of the 327 human proteins that Nevin Krogan uh, described in the talk uh, earlier. And then we can focus on one of them, for example, here is SARS-CoV spike, and we know that it binds the ACE human, but also binds these other two molecules. And then we can zoom in here and we can add uh, genes. So the genes that are encoded by this, we can expand by adding drugs, which are the drugs that we know bind each of these proteins. We can expand by adding which other diseases might be involved in, uh, in, in some of these genes. We can add cellular components, so gene ontology categories, molecular functions. Uh, we can also add anatomies and cell types of expression and so on. So you can grow the network, the neighborhood, uh, by just extending on any particular node of interest. Uh, last thing that I will mention is uh, the number of possibilities to apply uh, this are, are enormous. Uh, we're just starting a collaboration with NASA now to analyze gene expression from mice that have been flown to space and uh, spent some time in space and then gave their gene expression profiles uh, of, of space. Uh, so what we did is we entered that information from gene expression, we embedded that into the network and we tried to see which are the symptoms in the network that are get or, or the side effects in the network that uh, are hit more often if we enter from, um, from those genes. Interestingly, uh, we're identifying, first of all, pathways that have to do with uh, immune system and DNA repair systems. This might be due to radiation and, and, and the uh, immune effects of, of space flight. But most interesting, the symptoms and side effects, uh, you see that we, we identify neurologic manifestations, uh, uh, fever, uh, vision disorders, uh, dizziness, headache, nausea, uh, vomiting. So these are symptoms that we know on earth are related to the gene expression that these mice experience in space. And this highly relate to some of the uh, symptoms that astronauts are reporting. So uh, this is uh, very interesting. In conclusion, I would like just to uh, close by saying that we think data integration is a really powerful strategy to discover uh, unknown associations in complex data ensembles. Uh, network analysis really naturally deals with this complexity in, in biological data sets. And um, heterogeneous network analysis, we think, is uh, in particular a, a very promising strategy for drug repurposing. I will uh, just end by um, acknowledging the work of many, many people who work uh, uh, at UCSF, uh, Lawrence Livermore, Google, uh, Institute for Systems Biology, and NASA with us and our funding sources. I'll take any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sergio. That was, this was really a wonderful talk and it also took us to the outer space, I guess. Uh, so there are a number of questions. So let's start uh, with the first one. Uh, do you think knowledge graphs, knowledge networks are better at discovering novel predictions? And here, for example, the question is, finding chemically dissimilar drugs or drugs that are very different from what was there in the training data, more relating to how can we really discover novel things rather than just rediscover what has already been known and it's kind of okay for a rock scores, but it's trivial in other aspects. Yeah, so that's, it's a very interesting question. We're thinking about it all the time. And uh, it, for some areas, it will be obvious that yes, it is uh, the way to go and, and remember, a knowledge network is, is gonna be better the, uh, as we add more data and then we can navigate in different, uh, in different ways. So for example, in the drug um, uh, chemical space, um, 
the more approaches that we can, the more data and the more relationships that we can bring uh, regarding a particular molecule, for example, stereoisomers uh, or uh, chemical similarity um, uh, data, uh, binding uh, information. So the more data that you can put, the better the prediction will be. Uh, the nice thing about this approach is that it takes heterogeneous and seemingly disparate uh, information. All you need is an edge and a predicate, and then uh, is amenable to, to computation. So we think that the more sources of information that we're able to add to the network, the better predictability we will obtain. There are a number of questions related to availability of spoke data. So is spoke data publicly available? And if so, and I think the answer is yes, is how can people access it? Can people download it in bulk? Is there an API that can be used uh, for those who would want to get it, uh, the actual raw data, not just looking at the visual explorers? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the visual, the, the explorer is available already. So for the uh, bulk data, we're making it available through APIs and from both the translator program and the um, convergence accelerator programs, we're uh, committed to making that available. Right now you can access uh, almost all of it from Google Data Commons. Uh, that has been already ingested there, but uh, we're also going to make it available as a property graph. Um, so we're working on the APIs. Great. Um, another question. One of the problems um, people see when using knowledge graphs is the challenge of evaluating the quality of predictions because knowledge graphs sometimes might already contain indirectly um, uh, data that is being predicted. And also the, there is this problem of data leakage. Um, how can you control for this bias or yeah. how do you deal with this? Yeah, yeah. well, that's, that's a very fundamental problem. The way that we've been approaching it is by uh, curating the data that we bring in the network. So we're very much concerned about data quality as we are with quantity. So um, it's not just about ingesting every single data set that we can get our hands on, is vetting every database to make sure that it, we know the provenance of that particular relationship, that we know that it's a high, high quality experiment, that we know is general knowledge. And there's tons of databases that just uh, um, list uh, knowledge that is almost textbook. And so those are the things that are low hanging fruits for, for a high quality uh, knowledge network. Then when you start getting into the weeds and say, well, are we gonna incorporate, let's say literature into this? So far we haven't, uh, we're considering it, but then you start getting the into the decisions of, well, do you incorporate, do you weight every paper the same or do you weight every, uh, uh, statement the same and so on. So we're very concerned about the quality of the information that goes in. And so far, this is the way that we have to, to control the, the, the overall quality of it at, at the expense of, of, uh, of the size, maybe. Okay. We have time for one last question. And Aaron Zayant is interested in uh, how are disease signatures, uh, those that you showed us in the second part of the talk, how they're affected by comorbidities? The, yeah, that's a great question. And they are naturally, if, if a patient reports uh, uh, symptoms uh, on part of the uh, uh, drug indications, uh, those are all um, affecting the comorbidity uh, and, and affecting the similarity in the, in the profiles. However, each profile contains thousands of data points and some of them might be uh, traced back to comorbidity. Some may be exclusive for diseases and some of them may indicate subgroups of patients with the same disorder, which is highly interesting to us. For example, in the context of multiple sclerosis, we know that there are patients uh, who progress very quickly and other patients who do not progress as, as quickly. How can we identify these nuances in the clinical presentation and to what extent can we predict what the outcome long-term will be for that particular patient? 